Uh, he lives with his wife, Diana, and their dog in Hillsborough. And today, again, it's sustainability and sustainers. Barry Phillips. Good afternoon. One thing I need to do is to cut that bio down. It's eating into my speaking time. <laughs> I want to congratulate the club, first of all. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of your centennial celebration back in August. I just want to congratulate you as being the oldest, because it's right, the oldest civic club in the state. And you set a high bar, because there'll be other clubs coming behind, Durham for one, and they've got some challenges just to outdo the way in which you celebrated that great event. The other thing I want to say to you personally thank you for is the effort you're putting into this dental clinic here in this capital city. Because I know it's not just a one-off deal. You have made a commitment, as I understand it, to do 10 years of hard cash raising and support and physical support as well as just raising money towards an extremely interesting and, and generous way to, to help people who otherwise might not get that sort of assistance. So give yourself a little pat on the back. You're, that's wonderful what you're doing. Now my talk today, you've heard the title of it, but it's just a way of hiding the fact I want to talk about the foundation. <laughs> uh, I am the District Rotary <coughs> Foundation Chair for this year, and unless they kick me out, I'll be there for another two years. The fact that they asked you to do the job for three years may give you a bit of a clue that it's not exactly the easiest thing to pick up. I'm still learning. So one of the things I've tried to do, and I hope you all receive this, is send out ahead of time some information about what Rotary is and what it actually does, and what the foundation does within that concept. So the paper I've called the ABCDEG of Rotary and if you have a look at it on the back, there is some financial information both about your club, the district, and Rotary Worldwide. And I want to acknowledge uh, your presenter earlier on who made the Rotary Minute about a, an external global grant type situation happening in another country in Ghana. And that's a great lead in because I want to talk about global grants and how we work into those. Uh, one minor correction. The last time I checked, the number of members of the AKS have gone up. I think it's just over 500 now. But if the concept is that it, it is a fairly small number, only because people need to get up to a point where they can be that generous. So let's talk about sustainability. Let me initially talk about the mission of the foundation, because without that, there's not much sense to talk about why we try to support it. The mission reads, it is to enable Rotarians to advance world understanding, goodwill and peace through the improvement of health, the support of education and the alleviation of poverty. Now, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing people who've probably been in Rotary for quite a long time. I see some others that may not have been as long as time, but if we were around five, six years ago, you will recall that Rotary Foundation went through quite a sea change. It adopted, after some external consultation, a different way of doing global grants and doing district grants. And it linked them all through something they called Future Vision. Now I bring that up because Future Vision, as one of the things it identified, was a requirement that if we're going to be really effective in how we use our money and our donations, we should perhaps try to concentrate on six different areas of focus and make sure that what we do falls within those areas of focus. And when I read the mission just now, it covers four of those six. In fact, you could look at three of those six areas of focus and say they come broadly under health and therefore it covers them all. But that's not by accident. Whereas the mission and the focus do in fact parallel each other very nicely. One of the other things it did was to say, we must try where we can to bring in and help other communities with sustainable projects. So here's the first of the two words I want to talk about, sustainability. Now why? Well, because when these external consultants looked at what we're doing, and by the way, they asked lots of Rotarians for their input too, 
They said, well, we're doing lots of things in different places around the world, but they tend to be one-off. We're here today, we've gone tomorrow, we don't know what happens afterwards. And that wasn't perhaps the best way to use our funding, or our talent, or our time, or our energy. So they said, let's think about the concept of sustainability. Can we do projects that are built into them some education factors, some handing over factors, some financial factors that will make sure that what we do has a lasting value. So to go back to that Ghana idea you came up with, one would hope that the boreholes are going to be examined on a regular basis to make sure they're still functioning. We're going to make sure that those uh, areas of training that were taking place about um, hygiene are being continued. And who's going to do that? It will all probably be partly done through the local Rotarians in that area, but it hopefully will be done through cooperation with some of the people who are getting that benefit too. So sustainability, as it's defined by Rotary, comes under six broad headings. First of all, community needs. But here's an interesting change of attitude. Rather than somebody sitting in Raleigh or Hillsborough saying, I think I know what this rural little village in Ghana needs, Someone needs to go and ask them. If you had a wish list, what would be at the top of that wish list? Is it fresh water? Is it better schooling? Tell us what it is and let's see if we can meet that need. So it starts with finding out the local need through a needs assessment. Secondly, to what extent can we source the, the materials that will go into that project? If they can be sourced, you've avoided, sourced locally that is, You've avoided some of the problems that tend to happen in third world countries or less developed countries. Trying to get things through customs, inflated prices, the availability of spares. All of that comes under the heading, can it be locally sourced? Third one, and I've sort of hinted at this already, is there funding that will allow maintenance and continuity? The fourth one is about knowledge. Are we training people? You know that old adage, give someone a fish, feed them for a day, teach them to fish, and maybe they'll be able to survive and bring up their families for a long time. How are we doing that education part? Fifth one is motivation. What sort of incentive, what sort of skin in the game does the local community have in the project that you want to do? If you've done the homework on the first one, on the needs assessment, you've pretty much bought into that last one, but it needs to be measured. All of these things, if they are to work, should be measurable and should be achievable. Which brings me to the last one. You're not going to get Rotary Foundation to agree to a global grant unless you can show that there's a way to measure what you've done and what you've achieved and what you're going to achieve. And they work off a very simple acronym, SMART, and most of you will know this anyway. SMART stands for specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and timely. And those are five pretty classic ways of measuring whether you've been successful in any venture. So to go back to why those changes were made, why Future Vision was put on as a pilot program for three years, with roughly one-fifth of the districts around the world doing it as a pilot, and then it got adopted by every district a year and a half, nearly two years ago now, they did that because when they analysed what the money was being used for, there were a lot of fairly small humanitarian type grants where the administrative cost of running them was actually overtaking and using up a lot of the funding. So they changed the rules. They said from now on, if you do a global grant, it doesn't happen as a global grant unless it's got a $30,000 package to it. Now you can go up as far as $400,000 but that's a very different pattern from the 11 or 12 different types of grants that used to happen if you go back five, six years ago. The other thing they did was to emphasize stewardship. Because part of the deal was, we're going to give you as a district more of your money back than you used to get. But you've got to control it in a, in a different way. And in a way which is both very visible and accountable. So that's why we train every year two people from every club and we sort of insist that one of them must be the incoming president and one other club member to go through a formal training process to understand what the global and the district grant process is all about so that we can give our 
confirmation back up the road to the foundation and say, as a district, we have trained our clubs and they know the responsibilities they're taking on. So let's go to another part of the sustainability, which is funding. Now, I know your club has been very generous and I know it will continue to be very generous. I also know that your commitment, both to the centennial year and your local projects, is probably going to restrain a little bit some of the opening up of the checkbook and the purses. So let me just acknowledge that. But there, there's still a message I can give you about how the funding operates. And I hope there'll be time before I finish to talk a little bit about another way to support, which is not directly funding, but is by way of estate planning and putting something into your wills that will help Rotary when you pass. You probably know that every dollar that you give to the annual fund goes towards both recognized for you personally and your club and the district. And if you add those dollars up and you look at what happened last year, as a district, we put $416,000 into the annual fund. So what happens to that money? Because if you're good stewards of, of any sort of funding, you're going to say, that's fine, now tell me what you did with it. Well, first of all, 92% of it goes back and gets used one way or another in grants, whether it be district, that is local, or mainly local, or global. The other 8% goes on some fundraising and administration. But we don't get that money straight away. We're not going to have a $208,000 check in our hands come July the 1st. Why not? Because it gets invested for three years. And the investment revenue is used to fund the administrative costs of the foundation. At the end of the three years, however, it does come available to us. What they do is this, they divide it in half. Half it goes towards the global fund. And we as a district, and you as a club, can get your hands on some of that money if you do a global grant. Because Rotary Foundation will match dollar for dollar whatever is being put in by the district under a global grant. It will also match 50 cents on the dollar everything the club puts in directly to a global grant. So you can see there's a multiplying factor going on here. So half of it's got into that global fund sitting there waiting for us to make use of it. The other half comes back to us as a single check. But it doesn't come without any strings. We have to apply for it. And we have to apply for it by asking every club late in their rotary year to say what they want to do by way of a district grant in the next rotary year. So hopefully that's the process your club has been going through. What the district committee does, the grants committee, is to bring all those applications from the various clubs around the district into one communal pot and send the list of that up to the foundation. Like this coming year, we've, we've asked for 90 odd thousand dollars. And 70,000 of that will be covered by 2,000 here, 500 there, 1,000 there, spread around the clubs. And we're allowed to build in a 20% contingency because we know some club will be a bit later putting in their applications. District grants, as you probably remember, have to be used and spent within one rotary year. They also have to be audited and accounted for and reported on within that year. There's only 12 months in a year, so we try to accentuate and accelerate the process of applying so that there's more time for every club to spend that money. Now, there are a couple of other areas in which funding is important. I would be remiss of me if I didn't mention them. First, I mentioned two. One is the annual fund, the other is giving money directly to a grant. The third way in which all of us ought to be conscious of making a difference is to continue our effort to get polio out of this world. Eliminating polio for good is not only possible, but it's looking more and more likely. We're down to three countries now where it's endemic, and one of those, Nigeria, hasn't had an active case for several months. If that continues for a full three years, it will be considered clean of polio in the same way that India was two years ago. That will leave Afghanistan and Pakistan. So please keep that in your mind. So I do have a few minutes left, and let me talk about another way in which we can, we can help here. I'm privy to look at the, the, every club's giving pattern in history. 
So I know how generous as a group you are. But there's another little column that comes up when I ask for the, the report to be shown. And that's talking about, well, there's two other columns, one, both of which I want to talk about. One is sustainability in terms of sustaining members. We, for a long time, have had the concept that every Rotarian gives something every year, E-R-E-Y. If we can make that at a minimum of $100, a hundred dollars from any one of you makes you a sustaining member of Rotary. So that's the first little avenue to get to, which I think you will do. But there's another couple of columns, one of which says, are you a benefactor? And there's a level up from that saying, are you a bequest member, bequest society member? So what's this benefactor? I think there are a couple of attorneys in the room, so they're going to correct me if I get this wrong, but it's a legal term saying that you're going to give some form of value or an asset at some point in the future to another party. In other words, you're going to say, I want there to be some money going to Rotary Foundation when I pass. If you do that at the level of $1,000, that makes you a benefactor. Now I know, because I've seen the figures, there's not many of you who could put your hand up and say you've done that. And that's nothing out of your checkbook now. That's not going to impact how you support your, your district and how you support your local grant activity. But it could be a major factor in building up Rotary to be in such a strong financial position that it's able to continue and sustain its good work around the world. So please, my challenge and my request to you is think about becoming at least a benefactor. If you can raise that to $10,000, you become a Bequest Society member. And you might think about it, but again, I'm looking around the room and seeing a few people with about as much hair as I've got. Why not put it as a percentage of your estate, not just a fixed amount, so that as your estate rises, so would the beneficial effect to Rotary Foundation. Now, I've got another five minutes I want to use a bit more time on. And this is aimed primarily at some of us who are at that point in our lives where we have to think about estate planning. You've heard some of my background. I came here from another country. I was a green card holder for many years. I'm now a full-blown US citizen. One of the things that both surprised me and encouraged me when I got to know about it was that the tax laws in this country are not the same as they are in some other countries around the world. In some ways, they are very generous. So if you haven't thought about things like charitable remainder trust, let me give you a few gentle hints here, and it might be a topic for a full-blown presentation at another time. But let's take those three words, charitable, remainder, and trust. Charitable means, as the name implies, that you enter into a documentation that says at some point, some part of your assets are going to go to a charity. And of course, the charity I'm talking about is our charity, Rotary Foundation. The remainder says that it will be money that will be left in your estate or be taken from your estate at death, which leaves something going on between now and then. The trust part just indicates that the legal document is irrevocable and it gives a permanency to what we're trying to do here. So CRTs are an interesting way to think about if you have assets that have accumulated and have grown in value, and that if you cash them in, you'd be liable for some pretty hefty capital gains tax. You can transfer those assets into a trust, and the trust takes them on, and there is no capital gains tax for you. But there's also an income part of it. So the income is that when you write the trust document, you have to have some return coming to you. There are various ways to do that. And in many cases, it's based on your age and the basic annuity type process. But you do get a revenue. So that's two good things. You're avoiding tax in terms of capital gains. Or three things. You've got a charity going on. You've got a revenue coming in. But here's the clincher. Part of the money that you give will be offsetable against your current federal tax. Now, there aren't too many things in this world where you get a win-win-win and you're dealing with the IRS. So keep in mind that charitable arena trust might be a valuable thing for you to explore and consider. 
And we have people within our own district who are talented and able to handle those and give you advice. We also have a group of people out of the foundation who regularly come through our district are very, very happy to sit down and talk with any one of you that is thinking seriously about this. So my thought to you is consider, if you would, Charitable Remainder Trust. Okay, that's about six minutes to go, and I'd like to see if there might be any questions I could try to answer. You heard the word try, because I'm still learning this game, but if I don't know the answer, I do make a promise to find it out for you. So, any questions? At the back there. You had mentioned something earlier about in your will, in your estate planning, you know, to include rotary. And I have done that, but how would the rotary even know that? Well, that's a good point. It's like most things, you have to communicate. You need to... I didn't know that that was... Right, well, please do so, because you'll, you'll, you'll make them very happy, and me as well. But just send them a copy of that particular clause, oh. and it'll be done from there. Yeah, a good question, thank you. Yes. Barry, can you give us the timing on global grants? Yes, I can. To district grants? Yeah, that's a good question too. I sort of touched on the timing for district grants, very sort of squeezed in. Global is a much more relaxed process, mainly because as we're learning, global grants by their very nature tend to take a good deal longer. It's not uncommon to see a global grant spreading two or three years from conception to actually taking place. So you can put in an application for a global grant literally any time. Uh, that's not a problem. You have to recognize that it, is a, it can be a fairly slow process because what will happen at the district level is our district grant committee will work with you and try to help and avoid any sort of snags that might be there before you get to the stage, which is an essential stage and the last one, of putting it digitally into Rotary Foundation's hands for them to say yes or no. Because at that point, you only you can make any changes, depending on what's come back from Rotary Foundation. So the, the trick, which I would strongly suggest, having seen our grants committee work now for a year and a half, there's a lot of expertise. They've done a lot of these before. So your direct question is timing. What you do is to put your idea, perhaps one paragraph overly, quickly to the foundation, uh, to the, the, sorry, the grant committee and say, we're thinking of doing X, Y, Z, and get a communication going. And they will start to lead you through. You can find the forms that will eventually be needed on the website. Then you start to fill it out. Then you share it back with the committee, and there'll be a, some back and forth on that. And at some point, thumbs up, send it to foundation. Then there's some time spell, so will they approve it? Once it's approved, then it'll take as long as it takes to do that project in another part of the world. You're not restricted to any particular rotary year. So we've got projects going on that initiated, in one case a year and a half ago, that are still taking place. And what I heard over the weekend, I was at the same conference that the bill was at, it's not uncommon to see things like a two and a half to three year extension, a period of time. Does that help? Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you for your time, and I'm very much available to answer any specific uh, inquiries you might have about the estate planning part. So thank you.